video is in the evolution unit, uh, learning targets 16 through 18 on the origins of life. And so here we're going to look um, back to the beginnings of the earth and see how life came about. So here's a picture of a volcano, um, just because usually you have to talk about volcanoes when you talk about the origin of life. And so formation of, a, of the earth, uh, how is the earth formed? Well, the earth is thought to have formed with the collision of a Mars-sized planet and our own original planet. And essentially what happens when two rocks this big collide is they both turn to molten fire. And so the earth melts. And when you have a ball of lava and lots of other chemicals and different things uh, here, what's going to happen into this giant mass is the most dense materials are going to go to the center. And so you're going to have the most dense materials at the Earth's core. And the least dense materials are going to move towards the outside. And so this is where you have the Earth's crust, for instance, which is a very uh, it's much less dense than the mantle and the core. And then you have the least dense layer of the Earth, our atmosphere. And so this particular event is crucial for forming the atmosphere of the Earth because the least dense materials, all the gases, move out and are still kept by the Earth by the gravitational pull. And so this forms our atmosphere. And the early Earth atmosphere was full of some wonderful chemicals like hydrogen cyanide and CO2, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and water. Notice there's plenty of oxygen, but no free oxygen. There's no free oxygen in the atmosphere. And so the Earth is completely devoid of breathable oxygen at this point. And of course, the Earth is just a big ball of fire at this point as well. And so as the Earth begins to cool, you're going to have the formation of the oceans. Because as the Earth begins to cool, after millions of years, it's going to take millions of years for a rock this big to cool down after that sort of event, the water vapor that is in the air is going to condense and fall to the Earth. And this is going to form the oceans. It's a constant rain down on the Earth. And you're going to have this ocean that is kind of filled with iron and all other sorts of different stuff. And the big thing here is that you have water, which is going to provide protection from the sun, and it's going to possibly create the elements for life to come about. And so you have all of these different organic molecules, or inorganic molecules, excuse me, in the atmosphere and in the water, but no organic molecules. And so you, in this picture, you see some organic molecules like amino acids and, and glucose and some nucleotides and different things. None of these were present in the early Earth, but in order for life to form, they have to form these organic molecules that make us up. And so how do they form? Well, these two men, Miller and Urey, again, two names that you won't see apart from one another, um, come up with this experiment called the Miller-Urey experiment, and the purpose of it was to prove that organic materials could arise from materials present on primitive Earth, this Earth with no oxygen. And so here's a kind of a setup of their experiment. You can see this here. The early gases of the Earth were put in this chamber that's made. Let's see if I've got a better picture. Yes, I do here in this chamber, and here are some of the early Earth gases, along with some of the other ones that I listed. Hydrogen cyanide and all these different things going on. And they were mixed in here with water vapor. Here you have some boiling water simulating the early Earth oceans. And so you have lots of water vapor. And you add this water vapor in with these different gases. And then they have a spark, which is going to simulate lightning. 
being sent through the mixture at a regular rate. But what is that lightning going to do to the chemical bonds that are binding up all these different chemicals, particularly the carbon? It's going to cause those to break. And so they're going to pass through this condenser here, all those new molecules. It's going to cause them to kind of rain down, so to speak, turn back to water. And then you have this collector down here at the bottom, which was drawn poorly before. So you have this kind of bowl down here. Maybe it wasn't drawn much better this time. And you actually have this black soup that begins to form down here in this collector. All right. And this experiment runs for quite some time, maybe a couple of weeks. Well, down there in this black liquid that's collected through these newly formed molecules, there are found amino acids. There are found nucleotides. These nucleotides, these amino acids, are the very basis for life, the basis for DNA and proteins like we think of today. And so this Miller-Urey experiment proved how life could have come about from that primitive Earth where there's no oxygen and very violent. And so some other things had to occur for life to happen. Not only these organic molecules, but there had to have been some sort of system, some sort of uh, closed system for these organic molecules to exist in. And so we have these little structures called proteinoid microspheres. These are bubbles, essentially, that form in solution that have a selectively permeable membrane. But what's a selectively permeable membrane that we've talked about before? Your cell membranes. And so under certain conditions, these bubbles can form. And these are thought to be the precursors of cell membranes. So here's the selectively permeable again. A, a selectively permeable membrane can allow certain things in, keep certain things out. And so you have a, you have a self-contained system where these reactions can occur. Well, the next thing that has to happen is there has to be a way for these reactions to keep happening. And so this is where our nucleic acids are going to come in. RNA would have been the first of the nucleic acids. RNA is important and because it's the most simple, it's, it's one strand and it's simpler, um, would have been important for the storage and replication of information. How do you make proteins? Well, DNA or the DNA, the RNA are going to store that information. RNA molecules would have acted as enzymes in order to speed up reactions. And so this is this is known as the RNA world hypothesis that RNA not only stores information but also acts as enzymes in order to catalyze reactions. And so you end up having this little self-contained system. Now eventually it would have been essential for the formation of DNA because DNA is a much more stable molecule than RNA and it would have been thus RNA would have been selected against the DNA and so eventually you're going to have organisms that have DNA based systems RNA still serves a role in those cells like it does in our own cells today except for these new organisms aren't based solely on RNA they're based on DNA which is what you see in all life today and so these first organisms that would have, ar have arised would have been very simple. And there's a lot of debate in science still today. Well, how do you get from this cell full of chemicals to life? Well, they don't know. And so what is it that causes that, that group of cells that, that little cell with chemicals in it to actually start functioning as life and want to reproduce. And so there's there's still some unknown there. But somehow the first anaerobes arise and an anaerobe is an organism that is anaerobic or doesn't require oxygen and because there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. Ox they would have lived under the water. Oxygen would have been poisonous to these early life forms. But these early life forms were probably photosynthetic, meaning that they used the sunlight to make food. And so what is a byproduct of photosynthesis that we've learned about? Oxygen. And through this, oxygen would have begun to build up 
in the early Earth atmosphere. Well, what's going to call that's going to cause a couple of things to occur. That's going to cause the formation of the ozone layer. What ozone is is the chemical formula for ozone is is O3, and so oxygen basically goes up into the atmosphere. It gets radiated by the sun and forms into O3. Essentially, there's another oxygen being added there, of course, and makes this O3 molecule. Well, ozone's important because ozone protects the Earth from UV light. And this is, the sun is very dangerous, of course, if it's not being shielded by the ozone. And so creatures are going to be able to be safer at the surface of the water. And what else is at the surface of the water? Oxygen. And so you're going to begin having creatures that can use this oxygen to live. And so now you're going to have the first aerobic organisms or organisms that can use oxygen. And these are the first creatures that use some form of cellular respiration as a way to obtain energy. And that leads us to this idea called the endosymbiosis theory. Because up to this point, we only have prokaryotic organisms. These organisms don't have nuclei. They don't have any other organelles. Very simple organisms. But this endosymbiosis theory explains how it is possible that eukaryotic organisms came about. And so, I actually like to draw this. So let's say we have some primitive cell. And we have some other primitive cell here. And this red cell can use oxygen. It does cellular respiration. Well, let's say this black cell eats the red cell. And rather than digest it and kill it, this larger cell would use this smaller cell cellular respiration machinery to fuel its own energy needs. And so they form this interdependent kind of relationship. And so you can imagine over time, these, and these cells become one organism. And this is kind of the precursor to mitochondria, which is then the first animal cells right? Well, the first eukaryotic cells. Well, let's say that this cell it has this red thing in it. Well, it finds a little green life form. And this little green life form is able to do photosynthesis. Well, it's going to eat that and it's going to use its machinery in order to do cellular respiration. So now this plant can, or this organism can also does, it does cellular respiration, but can also do photosynthesis with a little green organism. And so this is going to be the precursor to the first plant cells. And so again, this idea is called the endosymbiosis theory, because endo inside symbiosis live together. They live together inside. And again, this is the this is an explanation as to how the first eukaryotic cells came to be.